Uh, I want to cordially welcome all of you to our event uh, entitled My Journey to Islam with our brother Akhil bin uh, Kenneth Ingram. Again, some background information on brother Akhil. Um, his full name is uh, Abu Rahina Al Akhil bin Kenneth Ingram. He spent a few years studying at Islamic University of Medina in Medina, Saudi Arabia. Uh, he further had an opportunity to meet or participate in knowledge based gatherings with several scholars from varying regions of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Egypt, and Yemen. And he has been involved in invitational pro uh, propagation of Islam in the United States, um, in America, and is what is now approaching 15 years of work. He's enrolled in Medina International University under the faculty of Fiqh and Thomas Edison State College with the College of Psychology. He is also the Director of Language and Theology at the MM Learning Center as well as Public Safety and Correctional Services. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Brother Akhil. This evening, that we ask Allah wa Ta'ala, the blessing the exalted, to make bless for us and to favor us therein, we greet you all to reading of Islam and we say to you all, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We further would like to thank everyone here for the opportunity that has been presented before us. And along with that, I'm going to share with you all a portion of my honesty. In that, an experience such as this is very humbling. And as it is humbling, it is also somewhat challenging to speak about yourself in such a personal and intimate fashion when we know that the focus of our faith is not upon individuals or individual lives per se, but rather it is premised upon the relationship that the individual has with Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala, the blessed and the exalted. However, we all are familiar with the hadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-dalu al khayr kafa'irihi, the one who directs towards that which is excellent, it is as though that person is employing that excellence himself. So, we ask Allah Taala that he places some khayr, that he places some excellence and something that we will be sharing with you all this evening. Well, firstly, just some brief background concerning myself and my family life and upbringing. I was born as Kenneth Ingram II. Although the moniker that I chose for myself sometime after is Aqil, which is a, a description of intelligence. We ask Allah that He makes us all from those that are truly intelligent. Ibn Qayyim, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, one of the phenomenal scholars of our faith now in history, may Allah bestow mercy upon his soul, he mentioned an interesting statement when he said, Everyone shares in a portion of their name. So I hope that I share in some portion of that name. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah bless all of you. I was born into wedlock by my parents, uh, my father, Kenneth Ingram, my mother, uh, Talia Ingram, and throughout the first part of my life, the earlier portion of my years, I was raised in the church as a Christian. I was raised as a, a Baptist, to be particular concerning the denomination. Uh, in the state of New Jersey, in a particular church 
that is actually called Macedonia Baptist Church, Lakewood, New Jersey. Not an advertisement, but a club. In any regard, I just say all that to say that uh, I was reared inside of the church, and my family at that time to present has dedication uh, to the church and to Christian life. I would be in the church every week, every Sunday. I would be in Bible school, uh, Sunday school, just like a little chayla. For a period of time in the choir. Uh, also, in high school years, was in the cotillion, for those that are familiar with right, American culture, with regards to the cotillion, which is said to be rooted actually in African culture. Uh, eventually crowned the king by other cotillion. Preachers, reverends, such in my family. However, and along with that, for myself, as an individual, being a young child, I found some challenge, we might even say uh, some conflict, with devoting worship to Isa, السلام, devoting worship to Jesus, السلام, may Allah bestow peace upon him. And even in certain prayers that we would say, right, there's grace before you eat and right, uh, supplication that they have, right? They they say prayer, but for us that would be dua, we wouldn't consider that salah, right? I would not dedicate my worship uh, through Isa alayhi salam, but I will also, I will always try to call upon God directly, with the word that we utilize at the time, the Father, and so on and so forth. Fast forward a little bit. Uh, there came a point in time where my mother's activity in the church decreased somewhat. And at this time, I may be about 10, 11 years old, something of this nature. And I wanted to continue on with my relationship with God, my relationship with uh, Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, blessing the exalted. So I took it upon myself to read the entire Bible, because I wanted to know what to do and how to do it. So I did that. And uh, one of the, the first things uh, that I realized as a very, very young man at the time, 10, 11 years old, uh, <laughs> the, the realization that we're not supposed to have girlfriends and such, right, as per the Bible, right? So. That, that was something that was uh, quite groundbreaking for me at the time. In any regard, I continue on, continue reading, continue trying to learn. And a couple years later, we fast forward. In the neighborhood that I lived in, I'm from Neptune, New Jersey. In Neptune, New Jersey, we have what's called down the hill and up the hill. The people who live up the hill, they're supposed to be the people that have quote unquote made it. Um, throughout the early part of my years, into my early adolescent years, no, into my post-adolescent years, I would say, um, the way that I was raised, I was raised as upper middle class, um, borderline wealthy. My, my father, he has a, a very strong background in entrepreneurship, uh, particularly in the arena of real estate. So I was raised that way. Uh, I did very well in school. I was always in honors level programs and things of this nature. So in any regard, I had some friends in the neighborhood. The friend that I had in the neighborhood, a gentleman as I knew him at that time, by the name of Isaiah Gaines, uh, who now he's taken the name for himself, Tofiq, which you know means success. May Allah make all of us from those that are successful. He was an individual at that time, and I don't mind, I don't think he would mind me sharing this, right about him. He was an individual at that time, as now I'm getting into, we met when I was about 13, he was 12, 
until 14, he was 13. He was what we would say, running the streets, doing things that he didn't have too much business doing. Um, things that uh, I wasn't quite into doing myself, but we had a, a pretty close bond, nevertheless. Just a few blocks from where I lived at, he had a stepfather at that time, uh, an individual by the name of Agdomadik, Agdomadik Deloach, the stepfather. His mother was a, a woman of, of Christian faith, may Allah guide us and guide her. And in any regard, his stepfather tried all these different things, right, to try to curb his appetite, curb his appetite for the world, right, as it were. Tried martial arts, tried sports, tried educational programs, right, all the different things he tried to do with them. Nothing was fulfilling him. So eventually his stepfather had decided to give him Islam. And he did, and he took to it. And we were together all the time. Uh, we were playing basketball almost every day. Right? At that time, we were supposed to be uh, stars in the NBA in about 10, 10 years or so. Right? So in any regard, we spent all this time together and everything that Abdul Malik was sharing with, uh, who is now Tawfiq, he was sharing with me. And it simply just made a lot of sense. It was sensical. And many of the challenges that uh, I found that I faced in the theology of Christianity at that time, I didn't find that was what he was presenting to me. And eventually, we began uh, spreading what we were learning from Abdul Malik to other children in the neighborhood, right, in our school, so on and so forth. Many people became intrigued, and we were at an age that was a rowdy age. So we thought that we knew more than we knew. We thought that we were better than we were, and we were learning all these different things about Islam, and we were exploring the Bible, and looking into what at that time we would call contradictions in the Bible, and things like this. And uh, unfortunately, we were quite boastful about it. So we would go to people in our neighborhood, people of Christian faith, right? Preachers in the neighborhood and things like that. We would challenge them. No, Islam is the truth. Christianity is false. We would challenge them in this fashion. We're young, young teenagers, right? Just beyond our, the beginning of our pubescent years. And uh, interestingly enough, the majority of the time, uh, the, the things that we were citing could not be toppled, could not be toppled. And we were quite uh, befuddled by that, right? We, we're just young people, right? You all have been practicing this for so long and you understand you've been studying it, but you can't answer these questions. At that time as well, one thing that was uh, quite large at that time period, and it's one of the places where it comes from, some of you may or may not be familiar with, called the 5% Nation of Islam. Uh, the, the five percenters, as it is said, we would debate with them and so on and so forth. Eventually, on an occasion, Abdul Malik, after these things continued for some time, he invited us to the library. He wanted to share some things with us about the faith of Islam. Perhaps we were getting a little bit out of hand. So, and I had not embraced the faith of Islam as of yet. It's just, just facts and some knowledge, just things that I didn't know about before. We sat in the library and he shared with us verses from the Quran that were highly concentrated on monotheism, highly concentrated on the topic of Tawheed, as we now say in our day. Verses like, وَمَا خَرَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبَدُونِ And I have not created the jinn, another creation as we do, and humanity, except for the purpose of my worship alone. Servitude, servitude to the Creator. We're wondering why we're here, what's the purpose of life? And in the Quran, so directly, so easily, with such simplicity, such, such, such simplicity, this, this, this is the purpose of life that everyone is searching for. 
servitude to the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, glorious and the exalted. This is why we are here. This is what we're meant to be doing before anything else. مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ رِزْقٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَيُّ تُعِمُونِ I don't desire any provisions from them, nor do I look to any of them to feed me or do anything for me. He's not in need of us, we're in need of him. Very, very clear. Then at the same time, coming to realizations, this existence that we call the universe that we are in, there are really only two things that exist. Right? These are the things that I'm learning, things that are going through my mind at the time as a teenager. There is the creator, and there's everything else that he created. There is no third thing. That's it. So then, if it is a creator that has created us, that is providing for us, blessing us, he controls life, he gives it, he controls death, he decrees when it occurs, right? he's disposing of all the affairs of the universe in perfect harmony. If it's only him that is doing all of these things for us, and the creation is doing none of these things for us, then why would we direct any aspect of worship to the creation? Why not devote our worship, our servitude to the creator? This is what I'm thinking. And this is what I'm coming to the realization of as he's sharing these verses of the Quran with me and with those gentlemen that were there with us at the time. Then at the same time, everything in our existence, he has made it either subservient to and or in the service of humanity. Everything else that exists. Right? The air, it services us. Things that are greater than us, easily destroy us. The, the, the sun, if we were anywhere near the proximity of the sun, what would become of us? Right? Yet we're millions and millions of miles away from it. And we still feel this heat. Yet, it benefits us. It services us, providing us light, providing us vitamins that we need, right? beautifying the sky for us. Animals that can easily, de easily destroy us, submit to our will. Right? Minerals, materials, metals, all services us. So then the thought process for me became, well then why? Why is it that he's created us to service him, but then everything else he's placed in service to us? Well then, I came to the realization that our Lord structured our existence this way so that we can have no excuse when it comes to fulfilling the purpose of life. Yes, enjoy the world, benefit from it, all of these things, absolutely. However, that is a secondary purpose. The primary purpose, utilize all of that to make it that much easier for you to fulfill the purpose of life in the servitude of your Lord alone by himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorious and the exalted. Come into this realization, share these verses with us. Verses concerning other things in the creation. <sighs> Have you not seen the birds in the sky? How they're flying in the sky, they spread their wings, and then they further retract them. Right, what is truly holding them up in the air? Like that. You follow? Right, well, when we do this, it doesn't quite happen for us, right? But for them, it does. He shared with us this verse, too. There is nothing that truly holds them in the sky except for our Rahman, the beneficent, the all merciful. Certainly, he sees all things. Changing our mode of thinking, getting us contemplating upon the creation and how things truly operate and who is the one that has put this operation into place. He shared with us verses concerning Isa alayhi salam. With Allah, ya Isa ibn Maryam. And remember, or rather recall, when Isa, the son of Maryam, Jesus, the son of Mary, will say, meaning on the day of resurrection, did you say to the people, 
Did you tell the people, take me and my mother as deities alongside Allah? Did you say that? Qal subhanaka. Glory be to you, O oh Allah. How free from imperfection you are. Ya subhanallah. Tasbih, glorification. Tasbih is tanzir. It is to remove something from our Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Removing what? Removing deficiencies from our Lord. He has no deficiency with him. He is perfect in his attributes. And in the perfection of his attributes, there is no deficiency in that perfection. He is all knowledgeable. He is perfect in his knowledge and there is no deficiency in that knowledge. He is just, perfect in his justice with no deficiency in his justice. Thinking about things like this. And he does not resemble the creation in any form and any fashion. Meaning what? Meaning in the verse, Isa is going to say on the day of resurrection, to, for me to have said that, for me to call the people to the worship of myself and the worship of my mother, that would be to attribute imperfection and deficiency to our Lord. To attribute deficiency to the perfection of his attributes, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhana, glory be to you. It is not for me to say that which I have no right to say. In kuntu kuntu faqad alimtahu. And if I were to say it, then certain you would have already had knowledge of it. SubhanAllah. I'm thinking to myself, in all the, the truth of the Qur'an that it is presenting, well then, if this is what he's going to say on the day of resurrection, and the Lord is telling us in the Qur'an, we already know what it's going to happen, what he's going to say. We know this now. So then how can we ignore that reality? Things like this. Abdul Malik, Allah, may Allah preserve him. He allowed me to borrow a book, a very small book at the time. It still exists today. It's given out for free in Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, different places, and print here in the U.S. too. At the time, it was a 32-page book, a book called The True Religion, authored by Dr. Abu Amin of Allah, small treatise. Hayda Allah, may Allah preserve him. In this book, he speaks more about this issue of monotheism. This topic of Tawheed, this issue of having a direct relationship with the Creator without any intermediary between. We have direct access to God. He's speaking about this here. And towards the tail end of the book, he explains, uh, and of course I'm paraphrasing here at this point, this was some time ago, that if you believe the aforementioned, then you're a Muslim. And this is the way to embrace Islam. So, those things that he said to say inside of that book, I said those things, which I later understood to be the shahada, the testimony of faith. 14 years of age at the time. Changed my world. Changed my world. In many different ways. From them, as I stated, uh, My father's side of the family is a, a deeply spiritual family, a deeply Christian family. A family that is uh, on the up and up, as we would say. My mother's side of the family, uh, that side of the family was much more worldly, we'll say. That side of the family was more so into living the life of the streets, as we would say. So I was reared having the opportunity to experience both sides of the spectrum. In any regard, when my parents realized that I was changing, that my beliefs were changing, that I was trying to do something different than what I was being reared upon, Well, they didn't like that very much. To the point that my father, uh, 
Actually, he told me this, right? And I don't, I don't mind sharing. He told me, after realizing where am I getting these ideas from, one of my neighbors just a couple blocks away, they thought I was being brainwashed. That's what they thought. They thought I wasn't really coming with this for myself. My father told me, he said, son, this is later on, he said, son, that's the first time in my life I ever contemplated killing a man before. My mother and I would be at odds concerning faith, theology. Why am I trying to do this? It's so different. It's not what I was reared upon. And just to give you an idea, uh, it, it actually got to the point where I was on the verge of almost being kicked out of the house. Not because I was a bad kid. Not because I was doing things I shouldn't do. Not because my grades were poor in school. My grades were, were top notch for right, most of my high school career. Because I wanted to do this thing called Islam. We would argue, we would debate. Even she would put me on punishment. Sometimes, literally, for months at a time. They banned me from interacting with Abdul Malik. And I knew enough about Islam that I knew I had to obey my parents. So I stopped interacting with them at that time. Um, my friend, Isaiah Gaines, we were in New Jersey. Ironically enough, he moved to Maryland. Even more ironically, he moved to PG County. Imagine that. But in any regard, I had nothing. I had never been to a masjid before. Never seen any Muslims in my life other than these two gentlemen. And at that time, I um, really didn't know anything about practicing the faith itself. I'll tell you what I knew. I'll tell you what I had in my head. I knew you were meant to obey your parents. I knew when it came to worship, we only had to worship Allah alone by himself, worship the creator. Uh, I knew about some minor things. Minor, but not minor things. We say minor just in comparison to other greater things, but they're not minor themselves. Such as the, the etiquette of utilizing the bathroom, the stinja, clean yourself with water, things like this I know about, right? Uh, the encouragement for one's pants to be above the ankles, I knew about that, so you had to walk around folding my pants up, things like that. And I had all these Bible quotes inside of my head. But I really didn't know too much about the faith itself. That was my life from 14 to 16. I just knew I wanted to be Muslim in practice, didn't know how. <clears throat> Eventually got a job at Burger King. Right? Big thing, 16. Got some money in my pocket. Worked for some months, I saved some money, and one thing that I did have that I kept with me, uh, I had a book by Muhammad Jamil Zainu called The Islamic Creed. Small book, maybe 60 pages. Questions and answers on what we're supposed to believe as Muslims with some evidence, verse, hadith, so on and so forth. And I had this catalog from this bookstore in East Orange. And I didn't know how I was going to get there at that time. So we have up the hill and down the hill, Neptune, right? I couldn't really go further than down the hill, sometimes without permission. I had to be home before dark. How am I going to get all the way up to East Orange, New Jersey, right? 40, 50 minute car ride away. And I would mark up these books. Working at Burger King, I saved my money, saved a few hundred dollars. And there was a gentleman there named Kerry, working with, work, he was uh, working at Burger King as well. He was a part of the Nation of Islam. My first real experience was somebody from the Nation of Islam. In every regard, I had this grand idea. He was older, I wasn't but 16 at the time. He was uh, 24 or something, something like that. I convinced him to take me up to East Orange and uh, so I could buy all these books about the faith so I could begin practicing my faith. And just to share with you, one other thing that I did come across, that I did learn in those couple of years, is about sin and about how sin can blacken one's heart. I did learn about My friend, Tofiq and I, that at that time, 
I couldn't practice the faith uh, the way I wanted to. Right? He moved away, and he was very attractive to the world of life anyway at that time. So we made a decision. We said, well, we know Islam is the truth, right? But we're really young, right? 14, 15. So we said to ourselves, why don't we experience life, do all the things that we want to do, we haven't had a chance to experience. And then when we get really old, like 40, then we'll start practicing Islam. This is what we said. So we made, it, we made that. So, I started exploring myself. He went deeper into what he was doing. And um, it got to a point where I felt as though my heart was blackened. Right? 15 into 16. It got to the point where I believed that I had trouble distinguishing between what was truly right and what was truly wrong because of how black I believe my heart became at the time of things that I was entering into. In any regard, fast forward, back to Burger King. So I convinced Carrie to take us up to this bookstore. We go to this bookstore. And uh, I meet the gentleman that owns the bookstore. At the time, the gentleman by the name of Zaid, be the whole law. I hope he's still living. I haven't seen him for a very long time. May Allah preserve him. And another individual was in the store that day. Um, by the name of Abu Mesa, Mujahid. He now has another store. He, he's grown, called Authentic Staples, right? And in a regard, so I'm so excited. I got this pocket full of money. I want to get all these books. I'm waiting to get for like two years now. So I'm going crazy. I want this book. I want that book. Give me this. They don't have this in stock. Well, I don't have this book in stock. I didn't understand. Right? No, this is the place. When you come to you're supposed to have everything that I need. So I bought about $150, $200 worth of books. We come home. Now, I wasn't supposed to be beyond but down a hill. I'm all the way up in the city. And I walk in the door. I'm going to tell you the exact time. I walked in the door at 7.04. I was supposed to be home by 7 o'clock. My mother was very strict about time. Right? So I walk in the door. We had a long hallway, right? Big house at the time. I have these two bags full of books. So, she tells my friend Carrie, go into the room. I'm in the hallway. She says, what do you have in your hands? I said, books. She says, what kind of books? I say, Islamic books. She became very furious, to say the least. She tells Carrie to go home. She puts me on punishment, takes the books away. Everything except for the Quran. Because, uh, unbeknownst to my mother, someone told me at that time, supposed to put the Quran in a high place. That's what somebody told me. So I did. So it was on a, the, my, above my shelf, right? On the very top of it. So she didn't see that when I kept that one. Right? I later found when she was hiding the books. I know she didn't know which books they were. I would sneak one book out at a time, put it back. She didn't know, right? Well, she may know now. We're on camera now, right? So this is how my adolescent years went. Uh, eventually, I met an individual by the name of uh, Abdul Mu'min Shabazz. He was a cab driver. Uh, he would, I would catch a cab whenever I missed my bus to school, and we would talk. He would give me da'wah. He would invite me to Islam. And the first time that we spoke, uh, he told me about Islam, and I'm like, well, yeah, I'm a Muslim too. I'm a Muslim a couple years now. I know this Islam thing you're talking about. So he tells me about this masjid. The address I never forgot. 209 Bond Street, Asbury Park. It's a town over. I never had the opportunity to go there uh, until the summer. I walked. Right? This big buildup for me. I walked. Walked for about two and a half, three hours to get there on foot. Got there, got to the bottom of the masjid, uh, opened the door. There were steps to go up to the top at that time. Heard these voices uh, up top. At that time, I didn't know. The voice was uh, an individual that has since passed, the Sheikh uh, Abu Wais, Abdullah Ahmed Ali, Rahim Allah Ta'ala. I heard his voice. 
And his sons, they had this hot dog stand outside, and they were staring at me. I thought it was weird. And I, in hindsight, I do look kind of weird, right? I, I was a basketball, I told you I was going to be a basketball star in 10 years, right? So I have this kufi on, I have this cutoff shirt, I have basketball shorts on, and I'm trying to walk into the masjid, right? I look off, they're looking at me, weird, I feel intimidated, I hear these voices going on upstairs, I walk out. Uh, SubhanAllah. Try to summarize your life in such a small period of, small window of time, right? Can't be done. Let's fast forward to take some of the highlights, all right? Uh, eventually, I came across an individual that, uh, as I told you all, when we were running around the neighborhood speaking with different individuals about Islam as teenagers, what I did not know, uh, one of our friends, an individual by the name of Anthony Dunaway, uh, his stepfather, he was feeding him what we were telling our friend. He embraced Islam by way of that at that time, but we hadn't met, right? So uh, later on, we met, but at this time, two years later, he's been practicing Islam for two years. He's an adult, right? At the time, he must have been in his 30s, around my age now. He's working, living life, and he has access to all these things that I have access to. We reconnected. He takes me to the same masjid in Asbury Park, 209 Bonds, and uh, meet some individuals there. I spent the week with him, learning how to pray, different things. Met an individual there by the name of Yusuf Lorbo. And by way of him, met some other individuals. Gentleman by the name of Rashid, gentleman by the name of uh, Nadim Lundi, and eventually met Abu Uwais, rahimahullah, who was the Imam at the Masjid at that time. 1997 is the current year. In any regard, in any regard. Uh, by way of them, they kind of brought me uh, into learning more about the faith, practicing the faith. They exposed me to, to a lot more things, and they would tell me about this university. This university in some other country that I really never heard of before, and because my grades were so good in school at the time, they were saying, well, you know, because your grades are so good, they'll take someone like you right away. All you need to do is apply. And uh, eventually I started taking to the idea a little bit, my like osmosis. I told my parents about it. <clears throat> they didn't like it. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe me. And they were like, well, so there's a university in another country. They're going to give you a scholarship. They're going to pay for your tickets to go there. And then when you get there, they're going to give you a stipend every month. They're going to pay you to go to school. They're going to do all that. And give you money for food and all these things. I was like, yeah, well, that's what they told me. I got the paperwork, something, you know, I, this is what it is. Never believe. And they were very big on me going to college and things like that. Senior year, I get accepted in all the different colleges, partial scholarships, no full scholarships, a lot of partial scholarships, a lot of acceptance letters. My parents waited until two months before graduating high school to tell me that they never saved any money for me to go to college, right? And uh, just to bring it together to understand the reality of what was occurring at that time, um, the life that my father had built at that time. Um, by this time, the year is um, 98, right? My father uh, was still doing real estate. He also uh, had a nightclub that he owned at the time um, called Skies. And in any regard, the club was not a good idea for him will say. And a lot of what he had, he lost. Uh, to the point that we had eventually lost our home. So that upper middle class lifestyle that I was used to got flipped totally upside down in my later uh, adolescent years, which was an experience I wasn't used to. I was raised as the only child. So in any regard, they told me they didn't have any money set aside for me to college, for college. Uh, they thought one, because he'd always been so successful in entrepreneurship all those years, the money would be there, wouldn't be a problem. And for two, because I was doing so good in school all the time that I would get a full scholarship. 
when it came time, two years before I'm getting ready to graduate, we had neither. So initially, I put myself through college for a year. And after doing that, I decided, well, I really don't want to do this, right? Uh, I went to school for computer science at the time. That was my major. And I just really wasn't into it. Right? I wanted to know about Islam. I wanted to know about my Lord. How can I live and, and practice my faith correctly? Right? So I decided to apply to this university. Now we're in the year 1999. I applied to the university. Uh, just what happened that at that time, this is pre-9-11, they would come here every year, do interviews. Um, an individual by the name of Idris Fidahullah was um, a student there. And another individual by the name of Fernando Durahman had a close relationship. Uh, with Allah, Allah will allow grant him success and may Allah guide him back. Um, he had a close relationship with the professors there at that time. He was also a student in the university there. So when they came to visit, Durahman was hosting them. And I knew these gentlemen. And uh, they were coming, not that year, that, at that time to do interviews, but we had a relationship. So they made this makeshift thing for interviews, right, on the cuff, kind of on the fly. So last minute, uh, my friend Idris, right, his mother, um, Tahira, may Allah preserve her, she gave the apartment up for the night so that we could have these interviews, right, cleared the bedrooms, and uh, people came from everywhere, right, people came from Philadelphia, people came from New York, right, uh, another a friend of mine now, an individual by the name of Sheikh Zahid Rashid, but all the people down from New York, People brought the people from Philadelphia, and uh, I'm just there. An individual at the time that interviewed for me, an individual uh, or translated for me, interview, an individual, individual by the name of Abu Hassan uh, Malik Akhtar, translated for me. They asked me why I embraced Islam. And I didn't have the ability to express what I'm expressing to you all this evening. And uh, I'm trying to express it. So, He's trying to summarize what I'm expressing. I'm trying to, I'm trying to tell them. And uh, he told me, we used to joke about it, that uh, he was trying to tell them, no, it was, it was the Tawheed, the Tawheed that brought him, it was Tawheed. So, out of the close to, had to be upwards of 50, maybe 70 people there that we packed into that two bedroom apartment. And a year later, two of us got accepted out of that whole lot of people. Myself, another individual, Friend of mine by the name of Jamal Jackson, be the love of Philadelphia. And goes to the, the Islamic University of Medina. I get accepted. I'm going to tie this into my mother. She never believed that the school was real, that I was going to go there, that I was really serious about anything that I was talking about, until my tickets came to her P.O. box two weeks before I was leaving. Then it got real. So at 18, I left. I left. My first time really out on my own. I'm on the other side of the globe. So I went to school there for a couple years. Well, more than that, a few years. And um, it just so happened I ran into visa trouble. After 9 11, some things got a little bit funky right, for some of us, right? So uh, even though my grades were um, quite proper, we'll say, in school at the time, um, one year came where, because of the way that I left, I had an exit visa, but I didn't have a re-entry visa in my passport when I left. And they told me that I could get it here when I came back. I did what I needed to do for a couple of months. A couple of months came, passed, I'm ready to go back to school. It was just over the summer. It was on break anyway. And they say, call us back in two months. Two months, I said, okay, I can do two months. September, October, I won't miss too much of school. Call us back next year, inshallah. We're gonna try to get it sorted. I said, a year, huh? Wait a year. Call back in a year. And that's how that went. Uh, ironically enough, the individual that was the Imam at the Masjid at that time, still in Nazareth Park, an individual by the name of Abu Tasneem, Dawood Adiv, Fidahullah, 
Find individuals I was able to build relationships with them at an early age, and they helped me out with a lot of things. Was the Imam Bey, he was leaving, and then he left. He wanted to go leave the country and live outside of the country. And while I'm trying to figure out how I can get back to school, I kind of got left with the hot potato. Because they're looking for someone that can like, do things in the masjid, right? Be an imam, give classes, give a sermon, so on and so forth. And um, I didn't have any real experience with that. Right? One time, my Dawood Adib and Abu Wais, they tag teamed me. And I say, they kind of tricked me into giving my first sermon to Masjid Rahma in, uh, in New York. Oh, excuse me, in, uh, in North, northern New Jersey at the time. But uh, outside of that, it was no real. I would teach small classes of Arabic, things like this, but eh. right? I wasn't really looking for that. Right? I wasn't really looking to be in the forefront and things like that. But there was no one else that was there. So they asked me, I thought I was just helping out. This is a small community. So things began to grow. Began invited, lecture here, lecture there. And before I knew it, I didn't realize it, there's like this whole circuit thing. Right? So I'm on the circuit trying around the nation doing different things. And that became being an imam in different places in the nation, traveling in and outside of the country and different things that it became. Continuing my studies and scholarship, meeting more scholars, going back to Saudi Arabia uh, a couple more times. Eventually uh, getting back with the university at a bit of an older age, around 27, 28. By the time I actually got a chance to get back there to discuss my issue with them, right? Years later now. And uh, they did admit that, uh, they said, no, that, that shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen to you. No, no, no. That was our fault, right? I said, well, it's your fault. Well, I still need to go to school, so, you know, what are we going to do about that? They said, well, what are you doing in America? And I said, well, how many men of a message and, and, and you're teaching the people and things like this? And I said, yeah, I'm teaching people, but I need to get back to school here to continue my learning process. They said, khalas, khalas, anta sheikh, anta sheikh. Now, you're a sheikh now. Forget about that. You don't need this now. You're already doing what you're supposed to be. If you were here to go to school, you're already doing what you would do. You don't need that. So that's kind of how that went. Um, ironically enough, ironically enough, and I, and I say this in being fair, uh, 10 years later, because I embraced Islam when I was 14 in 1994, 10 years later, when I was around 24, my mother... came to me, and uh, she apologized to me. She apologized to me for all the things that uh, she put me through when I was much younger. Uh, she acknowledged some of the things that she had done, right? I skipped a lot of the details. Uh, and she further said that I am proud of the man that you have become. I am happy that you actually uh, stood your ground and remained upon this faith that you have conviction for. And I appreciate the man that you have become because of it. And um, around that time frame, my, my parents they, um, and, and my family, they began to uh, build tolerance for my different faith. They began to accept me uh, for that. And uh, some of them actually became interested in the faith of Islam. We've had some conversations, some we still continue to have. And uh, I, I further learned that there were some individuals in my family that were Muslims that I didn't know, uh, which was quite interesting. But in any regard, and we apologize for being right, somewhat long-winded, uh, I was given this form of items to discuss. Right. A checklist, as it were. And I believe most of these items here we may have, uh, we may have touched on. But um, in short, that's my story. We, we ask Allah to Ta'ala that he places something of benefit in something that we shared this evening. We ask Allah to Ta'ala that he grants us sincerity. We ask that he grants us guidance and that he allows us to remain upon the guidance. We ask Allah that he guides our family members that have yet to embrace the faith. Hadhwallahu alam sallallahu alayhi wa That's all I got.
Uh, JazakAllah again, Brother Akil, for the very inspiring story. Um, inshallah, um, we're going to be having a, a Q&A session, inshallah. Uh, following, following that, inshallah, there's uh, pizza outside um, and some refreshments, inshallah. So again, if you guys have any questions, uh, Brother Akil, inshallah, would be happy to answer, inshallah. <laughs> Um, so you say some of your family members um, were Muslims that you didn't know about. Were they Muslims? Did they become Muslims during the time you were struggling with your journey to Islam? Or was it after that your experience insp inspired them? Excellent question. Excellent question. Well, in hindsight, in hindsight. Three of my older female cousins, who are Christians now, were raised as Muslims. I didn't know. They're older than me when I was younger. They were raised as Muslims. However, you figure, I was born in 1980. So they're about 10 years older than me. So they had to have been being raised in the 70s. The, the level of access to Islam that we have today, particularly for indigenous Muslims, uh, we take for granted. We take for granted. A lot of which they didn't have during that time. So they really weren't reared upon any level of solid, sound aqidah, solid, sound Islamic theology. And it was just a thing that people were doing. Right? They didn't really have any, anything of real, any, any, any real substance to it to hold on to. So they eventually gravitated away from it. Uh, two of them. The third one, till today, still claims uh, the faith of Islam as her practice of faith. May Allah reward and preserve her and guide the others back. And I had other relatives, uh, again, ironically enough, I'm from New Jersey, but some other relatives in Maryland, I mean, it was just destined for me to come here, right? That uh, I had yet to meet and didn't know, didn't know they were here until I had uh, embrace the faith uh, and have been practicing for some years. So, um, the ones that were, I didn't know they existed. I had one uncle, one uncle, Abdul Ghafoor, Rahimahullah, who loves so much upon the soul, he's since passed. Um, at that time, as a teenager, he was uh, the most apparent and the most practicing uh, of anyone in my family outside of myself. Um, but even with that, he was a newer Muslim at the time, and um, he passed just a, uh, a couple of years after that. So I didn't have a very long period of time to get to know him and him get to know me as us both being Muslims. So most of my memories of him, uh, both of us being non-Muslims. May love so mercy upon us. Next question. What would you recommend for U.S. born Muslims who want to study Arabic and Islam in Saudi Arabia or the Muslim world? Well, I'll offer you a piece of advice that came to me before I went to go study in the Islamic University of Medina, which at that time didn't make sense to me because I was trying so hard to get to Saudi Arabia, get to Egypt, get to somewhere I could learn. And I later did travel to all those places and meet scholars and learn in those places. But he said something. It resonates with me now. This particular sheikh, uh, when I asked a, a similar type of question, the answer that I, I got back 
from this Egyptian scholar, Rivahullah. He says, knowledge has no place or time. Knowledge is not limited to place or to time. Therefore, if you are in the U.S. of A, then you begin your quest for knowledge in the place and in the time that you are. I didn't get it then, but it makes sense now. Further, when we look to the earlier generations of the Muslims, the etiquette that they would employ in seeking knowledge is that, one, they will look to those who were the most knowledgeable of their region, of their area, and seek knowledge from them before those of lesser knowledge in their region. Two, they would seek to exhaust the, the knowledge that they had access to in their region first. And then after having exhausted that, then they would go and travel to other places to seek knowledge. Uh, in this country at this time, we do have access to some different aspects of knowledge. We have access to the Quran, its proper recitation and memorization. At that, uh, and even further, with ijaz, with licensure, we have access to that. There are individuals in our country that have enough knowledge uh, of the Arabic language to impart that knowledge and impress it upon you. There are access to those types of things here. Uh, Alhamdulillah, at this late date in this country, we, we do have uh, individuals who are uh, disciples of knowledge. We have individuals who have achieved a level of scholarship in their knowledge who are now indigenous Muslims that we have access to in our country that we should benefit from. Um, and we say this, we say this until one does have the actual opportunity to go to a, another uh, country that is a country that is actually uh, rich with sound, orthodox knowledge and spirituality in order to be able to benefit uh, from that in those places. So, in a nutshell, benefit from what you currently have until the opportunity comes to get to where you are trying to go. This is the way that that works. Um, a lesson learned. Sometimes we, we think about the quest for knowledge as this fantasia, this euphoric experience. And we think that once we get to country X, city Y, right, place Z, that once we get there, then this knowledge is just going to come to us. Right? Something's going to happen and it's just going to, right? But then you, you go overseas. You go to these different countries, right? There are people of scholarship there. You're in a particular school or a setting, and then you realize well, you have to do the work in order to achieve some level of knowledge. And the same work that you have to do there, you can start doing that work here. However, something that is also interesting and typical is that individuals who do not put in the work here, they don't put in the work there. Right? Unless our Lord bestows his favor upon them and they come to some realization. But this is our, our brief advice concerning that. So just understand, as the early generation of the Muslims was saying, uh, knowledge is to be come to. It does not come to you. Right? Knowledge is not possible along with relaxation of the body. It doesn't come like that. Now you want knowledge to come to you when you're sleeping, laying in your bed? It doesn't, it doesn't come like that. You follow? Right? The earlier Muslims, they would say, you give all of yourself to knowledge, knowledge will give you some of, it, some of itself to you. You give some of yourself to knowledge, it will give very little back to you. The questioner here states, you mentioned how sin hardens the heart in that period in your life where your faith was low, your iman was low. Were there any specific things that helped you increase your taqwa, that helped you increase your piety? 
things others may have said or situations you were confronted with. At that age, teenager time, as I told you, I embraced Islam at 14. I'm currently 34, so it's been about 20 years now, right? Um, at that age, what helped me out the most, good companionship. Good companionship. Uh, that age is a very impressionable age, we'll say. And because uh, I have begun to be placed in, in circles with individuals that uh, I really didn't know um, the quality and caliber of individuals that I was in the presence of at those younger ages, um, such as Abu Waisir Himahullah at that time, he had a very strong impact upon my life as a, as a uh, late teen. Another individual that I met th at that time uh, Sheikh Dawood Adib, he had an impact upon me right, at that young age. But I didn't realize really um, what those relationships at that age would do for me later on in life. Uh, other individuals that were around me, because there were no, uh, at least for me, I didn't have that experience. That was not my experience, where I had other individuals my age that were trying to practice the faith of Islam. I didn't have that. So if you have that, in places like this where there, there are communities that exist, communities that are structured and trying to service you, that is a blessing from Allah. I didn't have it. People turn away from it. People try to run away from it. I didn't have it. I didn't have anybody my age trying to practice the faith. So those individuals that I mentioned, uh, Nadim Lundi, Yusuf Lor, Will Rashid, these, these individuals, I was 14, 15, 16, 17, right? Yusuf at the time when I met him, if I was 16, he was 24. We have like an eight year, age year gap or something like that, right? And he was the youngest. Yeah, like some 30s, like Nadim was like 36 then, right? We were much older. So I didn't have that. But in my companionship with them and by them being older and, and by them being men, um, that, definitely, that definitely helped to curb uh, the learning curve, if you will. Barakallahu um, feekum. Along with that, along with that, I also found the, the more that I actually learned about the actual faith itself, the practice of the faith, the spirituality of the faith, and that independent, that individualized relationship with our Lord, and begin to get into that, the more that I got into that, the less the views of other people upon me mattered. One thing that I didn't mention, the more that I began to practice the faith, the more friends that I lost. Right? I was a fairly popular kid in high school. But um, by the time that I really began practicing, practicing, I had no friends left. I was by myself. Um, not only did I lose friends, right, I was greatly criticized. And this is something possibly I should have mentioned earlier, but um, I was between uh, rejection from my parents and family and rejection from my friends, and I'm by myself. Right? That's how I came up into the faith at that time. I simply didn't have access to what you all have access to. Individuals that are uh, non-indigenous Muslims, individuals that are reared, coming from different countries, where you have a whole society that supports you in your faith, and the people run away from that. Right, it's kind of hard for me to fathom anyway. Right, I wish I had something like that. I, I wish I had something like this. Right, what, what you all have established here when I was I didn't have any of that. I, like I told you for, for years, I didn't even know, I never seen the masjid before. Right? I didn't mention for those two years, 14 and 16, I didn't, I didn't even know how to pray. I wish someone would have taught me how to pray so that I could pray. I wish. I wish I could have seen somebody praying so I could at least mimic them. I didn't know. I didn't have it. So uh, learning about the faith, learning about the faith, getting into the spirituality of the faith, that uh, it helped to build my self-esteem and my confidence to the point where, uh, for me, it didn't matter, right? What, you, what a person thought about me, what you think, you know? 
Uh, sometimes when it's time to pray, people get shy about that, right? My thinking became, well, really, I mean, all of you, like at school, I was at college, right? Nobody was really there, I was a Muslim. I was like there by myself at that time. Like, seemingly in the entire college, I don't know, maybe some were there, right? I did meet a set of Egyptians one time, but they turned out to be Coptics, right? Um, my thinking changed to, well, I'm praying by myself, but really, all of y'all are supposed to be praying too. Y'all just not do it. Right? It's a different way of thinking. So uh, these are some of those things. Questions? Jazakallah wa khairan. Appreciate you sharing so much of your experience coming into the faith. What advice, looking back on your youth, and as a segue from your last question, how you answered the last question, looking back on your youth, what advice do you have to the youth here today within this community uh, that you've interacted with or in general who live in a very hyper-social environment mm -hmm. uh, now inundated with popular culture, influenced in public schools by other students, non-Muslims perhaps, or Muslims, and social media, while at the same time having so much access to knowledge at our fingertips? Yes. Um, in more ways than perhaps you did as a youth or some of our elders who came into Islam many years ago. Please. Can you tie my question would be, what advice will you give a community like this in terms of what we need to set up for new Muslims who come into the faith in order not to lose them because it's like there's a revolving door, they come in, and then poof, they go out. Mm -hmm. So can you tie that to the question that he... Question. Uh, I'll respond to um, both questions very succinctly. And um, after that response, if we would like to further the dialogue, please, uh, please feel free. I believe we have to learn how to meet people where they are and not where we expect them to be. Um, many times because of where we are today in the practice of our faith, we directly or indirectly, purposefully, or without being intentional, uh, we kind of expect people just to get it. We kind of expect people just to get to where we are now in much lesser time than it took us. You follow? So, I mean, my journey is at this point, a 20-year journey, a couple decades, right? And I'm still a young fella, right? So we would like to believe. You've been, if you've had access to the faith 10, 20 years, 50 years, and your parents, and your grandparents, right? Islam in the country you came from, it goes back a thousand years or however long it goes back. You expect someone else to come in? off of everything that this country offers and expect them to get what it took you 20, 30, 50 years to get in a couple years? Something that's been in your family heritage for a thousand years and they're supposed to get it in a year or two? No, doesn't work like that, doesn't work like that. And also from the perspective of our children who as uh, our brother stated are being inculcated and indoctrinated with that which opposes our faith. We have to learn to meet them where they actually are at real time and accept that reality. Accept the reality of the influence that they have in their lives. It's real, we can't ignore it, it's not fake, right? So we may not want uh, new Muslims or, or, or younger Muslims, uh, to experience peer pressure, they do. To run into the challenges of social acceptance, because they do. To not be faced with the challenges that sex, drugs, and rock and roll present, right? Well, that's real. So then we have to meet them where they are and help them with the challenges that they are actually facing real time, that which is important to them. May not be relevant to us, may not be a challenge for us, but for them, and deal with that. 
What are the things that they are actually interested in? Not what we're interested in. What are the things that they are interested in? And start meeting them there. Come down to their level. And then once we do that, then begin to slowly build relationships with them and then bring them to where they, they need to be. Right? That, that has to. That has to be the way. Right? That has to be the way. Um, and of course, of course, a lot of this comes with, uh, with newer Muslims and with children that are reared upon the face of Islam taking example from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and how he dealt with his companions for the first 10 to 13 years of the message. The focus was on building their faith. The focus was on building their spirituality. The focus was on building their relationship with their Lord. Understanding theology and then taking that theology as their own, right? Understanding proper aqidah and then believing that aqidah themselves. Doing that span, they were still, most of them, doing the same things that they were doing. They were living their lives as their lives were before Islam. You follow? Likewise with new Muslims and our children. And I'm going right, to cut this very short. Right? I see the writing on the wall. We got to go out here. Uh, once a person has built up the faith, then the individual will have the expansiveness and the depth of faith to be able to carry the practice of the faith. But if the faith itself is not built properly first, if the aqidah, right, if the theology of the individual is not instilled in the properly first, the spirituality is not there first, then when they come in, in the beginning, they may have the speech of the faith, they may begin to take the look of the faith, right? But the spirituality is not truly there. The aqidah is not truly there. Then we wonder, right? Brother so and so, sister so and so, they were doing so well, didn't they? they? Right? Which we can try to point the finger at them, but we need to take some responsibility for ourselves. Barakallah. Jazakallah. Inshallah, this concludes um, segue to uh, Journey to Islam, inshallah.